So we talked about the harmonic oscillator where we've got um, two passes on a spring and they're going to have, um, so we H psi equals E psi. Uh, H takes into account the potential energy between them and we get something that looks like this where these are my different um, quantized vibrational states, where this is V equals zero, V equals one, and because H psi equals E psi, E then becomes um, V plus one half H bar omega. Okay, so V is my quantum number, um, starting with zero, and this is where I get my zero point energy, uh, and then the wave function involves the um, Hermite polynomial, and, um, uh, and, and the, the Gaussian function and the radial function, right, so, so um, or the radial part. Um, so you've got, uh, sorry, the radius. Um, so you've got a different wave function for the harmonic oscillator. We get our energies, vibration. Okay, that's the model we're going to be using for vibrational spectroscopy, and that's the quantum number. Okay, feel good? So now it's like, how do we do rotation with the harmonic oscillator? We can't. So what we do is we introduce the rigid rotor. So mass one, mass two, some axis of rotation, and it's spinning. Now, uh, in classical physics, we would have L is equal to I omega, where I is your moment of inertia, taking into account um, uh, so I is equal to the mass R0 squared. Now this is the reduced mass depending on all of your um, various masses that you have. Now think about a molecule. If you had, oh, where's my big one? Go team, uh, propanol. So if you had propanol and this thing is spinning at you, it's got many axes of rotate. It can be rotating this way along this axis. It can be rotating this way along that axis. This is a complicated one, but you see that you'd have to take into account all of the different um, uh, masses, but you'd also have multiple moments of inertia depending on its axis of rotation. There's a great section in Atkins. It's a big table that shows you all the different moments of inertia for molecule structures. Okay, uh, but that's how you do it classically. And then this uh, is your angular frequency, which is your frequency times uh, two pi, um, or velocity times two pi around the curve. And that's your angular momentum. But we, want, we don't wanna do classical, we wanna do quantum. So quantum is, angular momentum is quantized. So our Hamiltonian is h bar squared j operator squared over 2i, where j is the angular momentum, uh, or so the rotational angular momentum operator. And it takes into account the total energy of rotation about a center of mass, or about a center of axis, or axis of rotation. So we solve h psi equals e psi. And in this particular case, our wave function is a spherical harmonic taking into account the quantum number j for this rotation, and m, which is the um, uh, uh, sorry, it is the same uh, axis of project or projection onto the z-axis of j, and it has both a theta and a phi component. But we've already done this work. We don't need to spend time thinking about how do we solve the Schrodinger equation. That's already been done. We are going to start from the energies. So we know from, thank you previous physicists, h squared j, j plus one divided by two i, and we get our spherical harmonic back again. Okay, is everyone following me? This is our energy. That's the energy of the rigid rotor of one particular state, and it has a quantum number j. So the allowed energy states of rotation are therefore, um, right, so here, and so if we take that and we say energy then is equal to j times j plus 1 h squared over 8 pi squared i. I just took out the h bar and simplified it a little bit, where j can equal 0, 1, 2, and so on. Go team!
Okay, let me show you where this looks on this plot. So we've got, actually, I'm going to zoom in a little bit if that's okay. No, maybe I'm not. Okay, so we've got uh, V equals zero to V equals one. Actually, I am. Why am I left handed all of a sudden? So V equals zero, V equals one. Cool? Okay, the rotational energies, teeny, 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 tiny. Um, uh, I think it was Frankly, who was like, how small is it? How small is an atom? Little bitty, little bitty, bitty. Um, go team. Uh, so the same thing here. So if I were to draw the energy states on top of the energy states for vibration, they'd be right here. There'd be like one here, one here, there, there, there. Um, and actually, they would get farther and farther apart the higher up you go. So I did that wrong. So here's my J equals zero. And because the energy is J times J plus one, think about what happens when J is one. This becomes, so when J equals one, we've got one times one plus one H squared over eight pi squared I. Um, so this becomes two. Well, J equals two. This factor becomes uh, two plus one, so three times two, that's six. Uh, I'm going to make all this stuff just a gamma. Um, so j equals 3. Now we have 3 plus 1. Well, that's 4 times 3. That's 12. Go team. But it's getting bigger. So there's j equals 0. j equals 1. j equals 2. So you've got the spacing getting larger. But if I were to draw this on the same plot, where this is my energy, the energy difference is here are so much smaller than the energy difference between V equals zero and V equals one. Go team. We will dive more into that throughout this chapter. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause for a second and erase everything. Again, okay, so we've got H size equal to E sine. We've got a very specific wave function for our rigid rotor and we've got an energy J plus, J times J plus one H squared over eight pi squared I. Okay. The selection rules for the rigid rotor coming from the idea that you have a transition dipole moment, psi final, transition dipole moment operating on psi initial, d tau equals zero um, for delta j not equal to plus or minus one and equals not zero for delta j equal to plus or minus one. Okay, that means that you can only have transitions going from um, j equals zero to j equals one, j equals one to j equals two, j equals two to j equals three. Um, oh, the sirens are going off. Noon on Saturday. Um, shit, it's gonna wake the baby. Okay, I gotta finish quickly. Um, so, uh, delta J, it can only be plus or minus one. And so if we take this EJ from our selection rules, EJ plus one minus EJ, I get lots of algebra. You can check my notes, they are posted on Moodle. Two times H squared over eight pi squared I, J plus one. Sound good? So that's the energy of our transition. Um, and from here to here, so this is our delta E. This is gonna be the energy absorbed or emitted upon increase of rotation. Okay, so now let me introduce how we use this. So our frequency is equal to, so delta E is equal to H nu. So this is from our photon. We're gonna transfer that into this energy, okay? Um, and so that's going to equal 2h squared over 8 pi squared i j j oops j plus 1 because this delta e of our photon is equal to delta e of our transition. Um, but we want to get this in units of a wave number. Wave number. Okay, 
we get this in units of wave number, which is typically in one over a lambda, um, we're going to introduce what's called the rotational term symbol, which is F. Yes, F of J. Okay. Well, that equals the frequency over C, which if you um, take this frequency, solve for this, put it in there, and divide by C, you get 2J plus 1 H. Notice how I've got an H here. My H squared is going to uh, cancel. 8 pi squared I times C. Cool. I'm now going to define all of this stuff as my rotational constant. We get a lot of information from the rotational constant. And it turns out then that my wave number of j is equal to 2 rotational constant times j plus 1. Okay, so now this energy is in joules, or sorry, um, uh, when I um, multiply this by hc, I get that in joules, um, but this is in wave number, okay, again, wave number. Okay, feel pretty good? So the rotational constant is a very important parameter. You'll be just determining the uh, rotational constant B for um, the HCL and DCL problem, which I will show you. Share screen, share screen. Okay, so here's some spectra. All right, um, so what you're seeing is if you were to put your two spectra together, um, you're seeing uh, both the vibration and the rotational transitions. Um, transitions are only allowed when delta J equals zero to one. So what um, I want you to look at is specifically the, vi uh, the rotational transitions. Um, so the spacing here, so here's uh, from J equals zero to J equals one. So that's from zero, so J equals zero, which is right here, um, to J equals one, which is right here. This is all happening at the same time as a vibrational transition. This is where it gets tricky because you always have delta, so delta J equals zero is an allowed transition, um, but delta V equals zero is not an allowed transition. So you actually don't see that here. Um, I got that backwards, sorry. Delta V from zero to one is an allowed transition. Delta J equals zero is not allowed transition. I totally got that backwards. I'm so, so sorry from before. Delta J, I'll, I'll say it again. Delta J equals zero is not an allowed transition. So you can't have Delta J equals zero to Delta J equals zero. That's not allowed, which is why there's a gap here. That's called the Q branch. Um, so from here, you've got Delta J is equal to zero to one. Um, so that's going from j equals 0 to j equals 1 at the same time as a v equals 0 to v equals 1 transition. Cool? Okay. Um, the spacings between each of these is equal to 2 times your b uh, rotational constant. Because this is j, this is j plus 1, this is j plus 2, j, this is j, j plus 1, j, j plus 1, j, j plus 1. So the spacing here is going to be equal to twice your rotational constant. And what's really cool is that's consistent. So notice how the spacings here, well, go team, they should be consistent. Hashtag and harmonicity. Um, anyway, so you'll notice here that the spacing, and when I say spacing, this is frequency down here, really should be wave number, whatever, it's an energy. So this value of this peak to this peak is your energy difference. That spacing here, that delta E should, or this is a delta E and this is a delta E, but the spacing between here to here and from uh, J equals one to J equals two from a V equals zero to V equals one transition is allowed. And so that's this one. So that spacing difference, basically the length of the red line is gonna be the same, mostly. Um, okay, and that spacing is two B. I hope this helps understand what's happening with this rotational spectra. Um, it's got, again, both vibrational and rotational spectra or transitions present. Um, awesome. 
I should also add, I'll email this out. I only want y'all to look at uh, 35 CL. You do have data for H, uh, 30 or 37 chlorine. Don't worry about that one. Um, unless you want to. If you're smart about your Excel file, you can just copy and paste. Okay, um, that's all I have for rotational spectra. Um, the, the term symbol F, what you're gonna do is look just at rotations. Um, but imagine now, and then next we're gonna look at vibrations. And then what's gonna happen is we're gonna couple them together. So the rotation is dependent on this R, but if you have, so if you've got this, you know, two masses on a spring, but then if you have vibrations occurring, they're like this. But now imagine as you're moving, that R is gonna affect your moment of inertia because moment of inertia is reduced mass times R squared for, for at least a, a linear rotor. It gets much more complicated on R or dependent on R, depending on how complete and wonky the, the molecule is. Go team. Email if you have questions. Hope the siren wasn't too weird when I was, uh, hopefully you didn't hear it. Awesome. Happy Saturday or whatever day it is. Bye.